<laughs> All right. Tis the season to talk of scary things. What scares you? Well, I, for one, am looking forward to hearing Liz James' version of the scariest UU service ever. And Harmonia is here to add to the atmosphere. Liz James? Liz James of the Unitarian Universalist Hysterical Society? Mirth and Dignity and Cra Cracked Cup podcast fame? Yes, that Liz James. Gather round. We gather this morning on Treaty 6 territory and within the homelands of Métis Nation Region 4. On behalf of those here at Westwood Unitarian today, I acknowledge that this land is a traditional meeting ground and home for many Indigenous peoples, including Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, Dene, and Métis. If you are joining us via Zoom this morning, I invite you to share the name of the territory where you are currently located in the chat. As Unitarian Universalists, we support each other in better understanding and living our principles. We value the worth and dignity of all people and respect the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. We seek wisdom from many sources, and are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are with us today. Those who have gone before us and the youth who inspire us. 
The ancient tradition of land recognition calls us to acknowledge our responsibility to deepen our understanding of our relationship to this land and its peoples, to participate in and support the ongoing process of truth, reconciliation, and healing. As part of our commitment to this process, Westwood's Reconciliation Soup and Speakers Series invites all who are interested to learn from, connect, and engage with our Indigenous neighbors. Details can be found on the posters, on the doors here at Westwood, and on our website. Westwood is an inclusive, compassionate, Unitarian Universalist community where we invite you to explore and deepen your personal spiritual beliefs, where you and whomever you love are welcome, where music is an expression of our joy, where worship brings us together to celebrate what is important in our lives, where acts of justice are a symbol of our hope. We celebrate free thought, and all people are invited to rest, grow, and serve the world. By this time next Sunday, hopefully, you will have put your clock back an hour, recovered from this scary service, come down from your Halloween sugar high, and be prepared for something completely different and certainly more serious. Asher Kirshner will be here to talk about peace from a Jewish Quaker perspective. All upcoming services and events are posted on our website. What is it, everybody? Help me out. www.westwoodunitarian.ca. You've got it. If you choose to subscribe, new posts will be delivered to your email. It's a convenient way to prevent FOMO and keep up with what's going on around here. Everybody knows what FOMO means, right? No, I don't. Fear of missing out. <laughs> If you would also like to receive the weekly announcements sent from the office, please sign the guest book on the table at the back and include your email addre address, or you can just send a message to info at westwoodunitarian.ca. And now I'm going to invite uh, Liz to come up and help me with the lighting of the chalice. Our words are from Jennifer Grayson. We come together every week, bound not by a creed or a mutual desire to please one God or many gods, yet we're drawn together by a belief that how we are in the world, who we are together matters. We light this chalice together in the knowledge that love, not fear, can change the world. Please join me in singing song number 301, the words to which will magically appear on the screen.
And now, Edda's favorite part of the service, <laughs> where we have candles of joy and concern. Uh, this is the part of the service where we invite anyone who's here and anyone who's joined us on Zoom to uh, come and, well, if you're on Zoom, you can't light a candle here, unfortunately, but you can uh, signal that you would like to share your joy or concern with us. So if you're here, we invite you to come up and light a candle and express your joy or concern or just light a candle in silence if you prefer so if you'd like to come up to we just head over this way is there anyone on zoom any of our zoom people who have a candle hello i'm rebecca i would like to light a candle for um having found a wonderful new pianist to join our our uh, group of musicians who play for Westwood. This is Janice Reynolds, and uh, we're very happy to have you. She's filling in while um, Julie is on maternity leave, and she's also going to be joining us um, as a pianist at other services. And one last candle for all the joys and concerns that remain in our hearts today. Please join me in the affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. And now we have another song from Harmonia. But first, happy birthday. Oh, first, happy birthday. I forgot the birthday candles. Yes, happy for all the October birthdays. Who else is celebrating in October? Jerry? Rebecca? Okay, so all the... and. And your son, okay, all uh, all our October birthday people. Uh, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to your October birthdays. <laughs> happy birthday to you. And many. Sleep, creep, can't run, can't 
upheave all our sound past a sleep. Take your choices if you will, it all might be a dream. Boo! Ah! Boo! Ah! Take your chances if you will, it all might be a dream. Boo! Ah! Boo! Ah! Take your chances if you will, it all might be a dream. I'm here this morning to talk to you about money. It's a little bit scary. <laughs> Are you wishing I picked something less awkward, like whether or not you should believe in God? God is not awkward. We could do that. That would have been good. Death would have been okay. It would have been Halloween-y. Not too scary. Sexuality would have been fine. But money? <laughs> I'm sorry about this, but they said to go with scary, and this is the scariest of the sermons that I have to offer. <laughs> What advice does Unitarian Universalism have for us about how to manage money? Surprisingly little, which is weird. We are not usually so quiet with the advice. The most common thing I hear you use say about money is a vague statement about how we're all middle class or upper middle class, which is not actually guidance of any form and I don't think true. Our congregations have many people who have previous experience or current experience of both extreme poverty and extreme wealth. And I know this because they tell me their stories after I give this talk. Myself, I have had experience with both, so I'm gonna tell you a couple of stories today. The first thing I ever shoplifted was broccoli. <laughs> was. I was 15, I was just coming off a stretch of being homeless and had recently entered foster care. My foster mother was struggling with addiction and there wasn't any food in the house for me or my two foster sisters. Now I'd reasoned through the morality of this as a little bit you even then. I thought a fair society feeds its children. I had a right to take matters into my own hands, that sort of thing. I had shored up my courage by humming tunes from Les Miserables, which was real big back then. But to be on the safe side, I decided I would steal the most morally upstanding thing I could think of, which was broccoli. <laughs> I don't recommend broccoli for your first shoplifting item. It does have the advantage of being found in the vegetable section, which is not too carefully monitored for shoplifters, but it is large and bumpy and it's hard to slide under your coat, even a winter coat. It's kind of grabby on the lining. Somehow I managed though. And then I ran home through the alley high on adrenaline and self-righteousness, only a kid myself and I was gonna feed my sisters. I unloaded my bounty onto the kitchen table with a triumphant thud and my younger sister stared at it and I waited for her gratitude and she said, I'm not eating that, it's gross. <laughs> so much for feeding my sisters. The main disadvantage of choosing broccoli as your introductory shoplifting item is that you are now morally obligated to ensure that it does not go to waste. And even if you are very hungry, a whole head of broccoli is a lot of broccoli. So the next time I stole icing, that went over way better. And then I stole some clothes I needed. And then I stole some clothes I just wanted. And then I stole a vanilla ice CD, which I have trouble justifying on several levels. 
Pretty soon I was just stealing whatever I wanted. I had gone from doing what was necessary to just being a thief. Until the day I stopped. I remember that day just as vividly. I was standing in that same store, chocolate icing in my hand, and I was thinking about my new foster dad. I'd been in that home for a couple of months at that point, and it was boring mostly. Ed went to work and he came home, he cooked supper, he read mystery novels on the couch and went to bed. There was always food, the bills were always paid, there was help with anything I needed really. And so there I stood in the grocery aisle, staring down at the chocolate icing in my hand, thinking about what Ed's face would look like if I got caught. He expected more of me. He didn't know I was a thief. So I put the icing back and I walked out and I never stole again. And for years, I thought this change was something I did. I had been a bad person, stealing things I didn't need, and I decided to become a good person. I credited my own strength of moral character for stopping stealing, for turning my life around, successfully completing high school and going on to finish university, all that stuff. This is a common and comforting worldview. If the homeless of the world are struggling because of some kind of defect, ideally a moral one, those of us with homes can reassure ourselves that the world is running fairly. They deserve to be where they are, and even better, we deserve to be where we are. We can feel good about the situation, and even better, we can reassure ourselves that we can expect it to stay that way. And so I tried to believe this, but to be honest, it never really stuck. In part because once you have been homeless, you are for the rest of your life at best temporarily housed. People don't sort into identities, they sort into temporary life situations. And this is a lesson that once you learn it, you can't unlearn. Also, I will say with some pride that being a UU makes it effectively impossible to believe that I stole or was homeless because I was defective or that I should be ashamed of that time in my life. What we formerly sum up as a belief in the inherent worth and dignity of every person shows up in any, so many small ways as respect. It would not be okay to disparage someone for being homeless in one of our congregations. We try to avoid stereotypes when we can, and especially stereotypes around people who are struggling. Attached to this idea that poverty doesn't arise from a personal failing is the idea that the world's resources aren't distributed fairly. We allude to this in the principles. We talk about promoting justice, fairness, and compassion in human relations, and the goal of community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Again, I also can refer to my general experience in UU congregations. In addition to lighting the chalice and singing hymns and those central things, we also have the attending of rallies, the writing of letters, and generally acting as a thorn in the side of the powers that be. Of course, we don't just do this about economic justice, we do it for all kinds of reasons. We never run out of advice, it seems, for the powers that be. So that first thing you use, that is the first thing that you taught me about money, that poverty is a social problem, not an individual failing, and we have some responsibility to work towards addressing it. So I'm pretty sure I don't have to try to convince you I wasn't a bad person when I was stealing. You probably already believe that my situation was a huge part of the equation and I should cut myself some slack, which I do, by the way. I now see the story very differently. I can now see once I was put in a good foster home, I used the support of that home to make positive life changes, including but not limited to quitting stealing. Put simply, I stole because I was so physically and emotionally hungry, and I stopped when I wasn't. Unsurprisingly, as an adult, I became involved with poverty reduction. Fast forward to my 30s, I was a core volunteer on an awareness campaign in Saskatchewan. We were aiming to get the government to implement a poverty reduction plan. It's a very UU activity of annoying, annoying the government, basically. So we chose a campaign titled Poverty Costs because we were trying to get across the point that it is more expensive to leave people suffering than to give them the necessities of life. Things like hospital stays, police involvement, homeless shelters, these add up. There's pretty compelling math that demonstrates paying people's rent is cheaper than those alternatives. So we chose this angle because it's true and it's a good argument, but also because it was very strategic. We were working with the conservative government at the time. And I don't know if you have noticed this, but Telling the conservative government that they are in danger of losing the Unitarian vote is not as motivating as the threat <laughs> as we would want. Some you use do vote conservative. There's no political test to be a Unitarian Universalist, but we lean left. 
conservative politicians do not generally see the Unitarians as one of their key voting blocks. <laughs> we can't just convince the usual suspects, a teammate on the campaign said, summarizing the reason for our strategy. We need to reach people who are oriented more towards money than people, people who don't care about the poor, you know, the ones who live in penthouses. I live in a penthouse, I said. I didn't just live in a penthouse at this time in my life, by the way. I lived in a, one with a huge rooftop garden overlooking the river in the most expensive town, part of town. And my friend knew this. He'd been to my house. We had held committee meetings at my house. All the color drained from his face. I didn't mean you, he stammered. I meant people who live in penthouses. <laughs> it's okay, I grinned. The tension broke and we laughed. The thing is, we all think in terms of stereotypes. We're taught to. It's not our fault. The part that's on us is what we do once we realize those stereotypes are there. So I wasn't upset by his judgment. My own judgment at the time, though, was more of a problem. I didn't feel good about my living situation. In the words of one meme I saw recently, how about we agree nobody gets seconds until everyone gets a first, a first helping, but for houses. Unlike many people living in penthouses, I knew in my bones what it was like to be homeless. I understood the cost of social inequality at a deep level. And so what business did I have taking more than I needed? UUism wasn't a huge help at this point. My religion has a lot to say about the worth and dignity of poor people and less to say about the worth and dignity of wealthy ones. I believe this is a mistake. People are people. Money separates us into categories and encourages us not to speak openly and it disconnects us and I think that we should resist that. I think we shouldn't allow money to be more than it is. We shouldn't allow the othering of poor or the othering of the rich. Both types exist in our congregations and both bring struggles. When I was struggling to figure out how to make decisions around money, I was facing a genuine moral dilemma. I didn't need value judgments for or against. I needed tools. I needed my religion to do what religion is supposed to do, help you wrestle with how to make hard choices and live well. I didn't entirely resolve this dilemma, by the way. Like with the end of homelessness, the end of life in the penthouse just sort of happened. My lifestyle came from being married to a surgeon, and when the marriage ended, I found myself in a little ultra-cheap apartment. Each boy had a room, and I slept in the living room on a fold-out couch. I want to be clear, I was not in that apartment because of anything the boys' dad did wrong. We went for a mediated process, he readily agreed to everything I was entitled to the, in, under the law, and that was more than enough. But I didn't know in the beginning how things would unfold. I didn't know anything about managing money, so I defaulted into spending as little as possible. That's what I knew. I moved into the tiny apartment because of frugality, but I stayed in it because I found out that I loved it. Living there felt like a deep sigh, like finally exhaling a breath I'd held for years. I had everything I needed there and nothing I didn't. Gone were the days of endlessly tidying and organizing and maintaining expensive stuff. Gone were the days of inviting a friend over to have their eyes widen at the sight of the penthouse and this feeling of subtle distance appear between us. Gone was the feeling of living a life that wasn't mine. I was finally living in a way that fit me. I have to pause to clarify, this felt nothing like poverty. It turns out poverty is not so much about how much money you spend, it's about choice. Poverty is being trapped, exhausted by constant calculations and stretching and not enough. Poverty is fear, an ever-present anxiety that something's going to go wrong and you won't be able to deal with it. I had money. If a problem came up, I could solve it. What I was doing by living frugally was making choices, not running out of them. And it felt like power. Like a good UU, I went straight to the library to learn about money by reading a stack of books. My favorite of these was Your Money or Your Life. The authors recommend a process I found transformative. You write down everything you spend and you categorize it in a way that's tailored to you. And at the end of the month, you look at each category and you think about the value you got from the amount that you spent. Did it feel like the right amount? Was it too little or too much? They also recommend you convert those dollars into minutes spent working, which was a part of the process that I skipped because I didn't have an hourly wage as a homemaker. So doing this process month after month, something kind of magical happens. You don't develop a budget so much as a feeling, like a sense of exactly where to find your point of joy. 
and that arms you against mindless spending. The authors call this the point of enough. And the boys and I discovered our point of enough was a great deal less than the spousal support and child support were. So we started putting quite a bit away, them in their accounts and me in mine. It would be really narratively convenient to tell you that I resolved the nobody gets two houses until everyone has one conviction by donating that excess money. <laughs> and I didn't do that. I thought about it. I thought long and hard about how much I did or didn't have a right to keep in the face of all the need in the world. Religion has a lot to say about this, from Jesus taking, talking about the rich can't get into heaven to the lives of Buddhist monks and nuns under a vow of poverty. And I thought about a vow of poverty, but I didn't take one because I remember being poor and I didn't like it. And I'm afraid of it. So no vow of poverty for me. But I have taken a vow of enough. This is not a cop-out. This is a serious practice that I put energy into. I've promised myself that I will always approach my spending with mindfulness and spend less than I can so that I can give generously to causes that matter to me, but also because I want that feeling of freedom that happens when your lifestyle is cheaper than it has to be. This feels like security to me, and I need security. It's a part of my personal enough. But aren't our financial decisions not just about us? Isn't this a bit of a cop-out? What about the need in the world? Don't we have responsibilities? And how did I resolve that? I have friends in countries that have no running water, so how do I justify going out for dinner? Mostly I don't. Mostly I just live with it. It will always be there. I am quite sure that no matter how much I give away, justice won't be served, because justice would be equality. And if I gave away literally everything, if I get sick, I walk into any hospital and they will treat me for free. And so my friend and I will never be equal in terms of privilege. It's not fair I was born here or my life situations. It's not fair that there are inequalities inside and between countries. The reality of the system is a lack of justice and none of us can give away enough to correct that. So we do what we can and we do it imperfectly. It's not a justification, just an explanation. People will act as people whether it's stealing when they are hungry or whether it's failing to perfectly divide resources when they have more than they need. I have cut myself slack for the stealing I did years ago because it was part of a larger system, and I cut myself slack now for the same reason. There's still discomfort there, and for me, I live with it. A vow of enough won't erase the discomfort, but it helps me live a life that's authentically mine. Your enough is gonna look way different from mine, I'm sure. It's all different. Maybe yours includes some car you've always wanted since you were a teenager and want to tinker with, or a chance to travel and see the world. My boys' dad's enough includes the penthouse. He genuinely loves it there. It brings him joy every day, and it functions as a community hub for gatherings and fundraisers and all kinds of good things. Money is, I think, a little bit like God. It's not the same for everyone. Maybe your journey looks like not having enough, Maybe it's different from mine in that way. Maybe you struggle with poverty and the anxiety and the sacrifice that goes with it. Every money journey is specific, individual, but it doesn't have to be alone. As you use, we encourage each other to figure out what we believe about God for ourselves, don't we? No judgment, we say, wherever you land, but be intentional. Don't just go with what you were taught or what's easiest. Go with what really fits you. It's worth it to do the work, we say, figuring out what you believe. What if we encouraged each other to do those same processes around money? Don't just go with what you're taught, we could say, or what's easiest. Go with what truly fits you. It's worth it to do the work. It's so easy to make financial choices without thinking, and we as you, you should encourage each other to deep intentionality around money. Above all, we should feel free to be honest with each other about our journeys, no matter where we fall on the financial spectrum. We shouldn't allow money to separate us into categories. We should keep talking, keep asking questions, and keep doing what we do best, sharing and wrestling with our questions in community. Gratitude. Gratitude is one of the strongest and most transformative states of being. It shifts your perspective from lack of abundance and allows you to focus on the good in your life which in turn pulls more goodness into your reality. Those are the words of Jen Sincero. I'm grateful for all who make this service and this community possible. 
all who contribute their time, their talents, and their treasure. Today, we especially acknowledge gratitude for our speaker, Liz James, who's come all this way to be with us, to Harmonia, who gives me so much joy in my life, and we hope in yours, led by Rebecca Patterson, and accompanied by our new accompanist, Janice Reynolds. Our tech support, we were struggling a bit this morning with the poltergeist, but they're back there working hard. Thank you, Hannah and David and Bill, who's always invisible, but doing all that good work online. David also generously makes us coffee and tea each week and brings it on up here and helps with a variety of things. And of course, we couldn't provide this space or programs without the generous financial support of our members and friends. Donations are gratefully received by e-transfer, or there's a donations box by the refreshment table and the information about where you can make those e-transfers. It's also up on the slide there for those folks on Zoom as well. And now we have an opportunity for you to sing again a very appropriate song, number 1010, We Give Thanks. The words will be up here. Going to recruit Liz's help again. Got to keep her working here this morning, as uh, to help me in extinguishing our flames as I read our closing words. And this will be followed by another contribution from Hamonia. To do is to be. To laugh is to risk appearing the fool. To weep is to risk appearing sentimental. To reach out for another is to risk exposing our true self, to place our ideals, our dreams before the crowd is to risk loss. To love is to risk not being loved in return. Those are the words of that wise author, Anonymous. <laughs> As we extinguish the chalice and the candles, May you carry their light and warmth in your heart and may it sustain you in all you do. from his slab began to rise and suddenly to my surprise he did the mash 
He did the monster mash. He did the mash. It was a graveyard smash. He did the mash. It caught on like a flash. He did the mash. He did the monster mash. From my laboratory in the castle east to the master bedroom where the vampires feast. The ghouls all came from their humble abodes to get a jolt from my electrodes. They did the mash. They did the monster mash. The monster mash. It was the graveyard smash. They did the mash. It caught on in a flash. They did the mash. It was the monster mash. Oh, from his coffin, Jack's voice is ring. Seems he was troubled by just one thing. He opened the lid and shook his fist and said, Whatever happened to my Transylvania twist? <laughs> it's now the mash. It's now and it's a monster mash. It caught on in a flash. It's a graveyard smash. Easy, Igor, you impetuous thing.